All right, we have a big crowd today. <laughs> Hello, I'm Linda Shore. I'm the Executive Director of the Astronomical Society of the Pacific. And today's Wednesdays with Linda is going to be all about kinesthetic astronomy. Kinesthetic astronomy. Get them out of their seats. So basically what we're going to start with is just taking a look at what it means to teach astronomy through motion, what it means to teach anything by using motion and body, uh, using hands, using your whole body to model things. And we'll also spend a little bit of time talking about brain science. Uh, what do we now know about the brain that suggests that this kind of learning actually is effective? Um, and then we'll give you some really great examples for how to do this with adults, because yes, indeed, it's not just for kids. So let's... Um, so who we have out there? So I see we have uh, David and Susie, and Brian, and I'm joined here in the studio at ASP Galactic Headquarters uh, by Eva, who is um, going to be directing this for us. So let's get started. <laughs> and if you drop out at any time or you come in and out, uh, these are all going to be archived so you can see them at a later date. All righty. So let's go to, oh, and I see Elizabeth has joined us. So we have um, a nice group of people. So here we go. Um, and Eva will let me know if there's a problem. All right, we're good, she says. So I'm going to get started with the question, what is kinesthetic learning? Okay, it's learning by using your body, learning by using your hands. And a lot of people associate this with children learning by playing. So for example, sports, um, there's all the learning involved in kicking a ball, throwing a ball, um, catching a ball, running fast, or it's dance, learning um, how to be coordinated. But that kind of learning is also associated with things that you might not immediately associate with uh, kinesthetic learning, language arts, and mathematics. So let's take a look at these two examples from really young children and how they learn. So in the case of the language arts, you're seeing um, a little kid learning the alphabet by placing these blocks into the spaces. So what does that have to do with learning? I mean, what, what's this kid learning? Just putting patterns into looking at a pattern and putting it into the block? Yes, that's exactly what they're learning. They're learning the shape of the letter A, the shape of the letter B, by physically holding these objects, looking for the pattern that matches, and then physically placing those objects in the holes. And that is an example of kinesthetic learning. It's taking a symbol, which we might think of as the letter A, associating it with touch, in this case also with color, and with a pattern and physically placing it there. And this all helps encode these letters deeply into the brain's memory. Whereas if I just showed the kid the letter A and said, this is A and took it away, you're not using as many of the brain senses to code the message. So learning the letter A is a little bit, bit more challenging. In the other case, you've got, um, a kid learning mathematics using the abacus and using colorful beads. Same idea. Um, the abacus is wonderful for teaching a lot of things, but in this case, it could be just counting one, two, three, with associating that number with a symbol, with a tactile stimulus. These are all ways the brain encodes things much more deeply. Now, you're probably thinking, eh, that's just for kids. That's just for kids. Well, it may be, and you may also be thinking it's just for kids and you can't teach astronomy this way for goodness sakes. What kind of astronomy can you possibly teach um, using blocks and beads and things like this? So what I'm about to show you is a film taken from My Sky Tonight, which is the ASP's own um, project that is uh, extensively testing how you can actually teach astronomy or bring astronomy to the very, very youngest learners that you might be dealing with. And this is um, 
hot off the presses from a recent piloting of some really wonderful children at the Lawrence Hall of Science who were learning about stars. Pretty sophisticated stuff about stars too. So here we go. Enjoy this short film. Oh, Sam says, come here. 
repeat after me. We're gonna say Cassiopeia. Cassiopeia. One more time, Cassiopeia. Cassiopeia. Perfect. Let's come up. All righty, can you all hear me? What do you think? Are you hearing me, Eva? Yes, okay. So um, that video is, is awesome, um, I think. And there are a lot of examples in this video, tons. We could be here all day listing them. The examples of learning by motion. Um, so what I'd like you to do, perhaps type it to Eva, um, go ahead and use your chat window so that we don't get overwhelmed with voices. Um, what are some examples of, of learning through motion that really struck you, that, that you remember, that really, um, and Eva will let us know if, they, if we get any responses. Size, scale of planets and distances. The size and scale of planets and distances. So in this particular video, so in this one, um, there was some bit of scale, I, well, in terms of shapes. I, she said, sorry, I thought you meant general. Oh, no, no, in this particular, but that's a good one. And we're going to talk about that. Thank you very much. Um, in this particular video, what were some examples that really struck you? Kids making patterns of the stars with their bodies. Kids making patterns of the stars with their bodies, yes. So teaching about the shapes of the constellations involved a number of different, and I'm going to use the word modalities, different techniques, right? Different strategies. One of them was showing them the picture visually. Another one <clears throat> was having them actually take their flashlights and place them on those dots so that they could see them. Another visual and um, kinesthetic. And then standing on the dots, going and running, and not only identifying which constellation was on the floor, but standing on top of the stars to form the patterns. Another one we have is symbolically representing relative sizes of different 
Great. Another one was symbolically representing the different sizes of the stars with their poses. So if you remember, the facilitator was saying, okay, it's a red star. It's very, very small. Let's everybody crunch down. And then here's another star. It's a, it's a yellow star and it's medium. And there's this super giant blue star. Everybody get as big as you can. Again, they're coding that information by their posture this time. Great. Any other ones? That's okay, you, don't, you guys don't have to say them all, but there are tons here. Um, and the thing to look out for, and look at the second one, how was kinesthetic learning combined with other learning? There was a lot of singing going on here. So they would march, they would dance, they would sing as they moved. That's adding another um, coding method because by speaking and singing, they're learning about the constellations through the song as they're moving. In some cases, they were watching something while they were moving. They were listening for things as they were moving. Um, and you're going to see with, with little children, you often want to read to them, sing to them, have them move their bodies, have them move around, in addition to showing them things visually. And so here's the tough one, I think. What do you think the children were learning? What do you think they were learning? For example, I'll tell you something they weren't learning. They, probably didn't learn nuclear synthesis just thinking didn't learn that one but what did they learn about stars and you can go ahead and type in the chat space and if you're watching um, the archive you can just think think about it and jot it down stars come in different types there are different types of stars they're not all the same at this age that's huge that may be more than their parents know <laughs> what else properties of the stars that they come in different colors in a different in, in addition to come coming in different sizes temperatures. temperatures that they're hot ones what was it hot really hot and super duper hot or something like that that they were all hot but they were different levels of hotness <laughs> the color to temperature that's a huge one that that blue meant super duper big and super duper hot. And red meant hot, not so big. Um, this is a lot, let me tell you right now, for, a, for a, a child at this age to absorb, I'm not sure how much of all of this that they're absor absorbing, but they're storing pieces in memory. And as, as they go on in life, and more information is added to those pieces and stored into memory, they get a deeper understanding. We're not expecting these children to know everything about stars at this point in their lives at all. Eat just the basics. All right, are you seeing my... Okay, then my other question was, what about as an adult? So can this work with grown-ups? So the question I have for you is, have you ever experienced this kind of learning as an adult? And if you have, what was it like? Or what did you, what kind of learning did you experience? Any contributions to stuff? Anything? Done? I'll tell you some I've, I've done. Um, I don't know a lot of biology. Astrophysics is more my thing, but I was involved in a kinesthetic activity where we all had to be pieces of the inside of a cell and do our jobs. Oh, there is a scaled walk in DC for the planet. Excellent. If any of you have ever experienced scale model walks of the solar system, and there are lots of them out there, that's kinesthetic learning. I could tell you the distances in numbers, but that probably wouldn't encode very firmly in your head. My numbers may not mean so much to you. I could read it to you in a book. I could show you a picture. But if I have you walk the physical distance, that encodes in another part of memory that along with the numbers and along with the pictures makes the learning richer. That's a great example. Great example. Um, I was the mitochondria. <laughs> Bridge. Oh, the MIT bridge? It's called the MIT bridge. Well, we have, <laughs> we have the, the scale, um, oh, the distance it, 
in of the solar system? No, they have like a a distance measured out. I I, I don't know. I went to Boston University, so <laughs> I don't. Oop, can't say what MIT did. <laughs> All right. Well, let's do a little bit of brain science. Um, I enjoy brain science myself. So what is actually going on? So we've known for a long time that kinesthetic learning combined with other methods is a very powerful way to learn, but it isn't until recently with the advent of um, imaging techniques that we can really see what's going on. So we've known for a fairly long time that different regions of the brain are responsible for different types of coding. And I could go through all these for you, but you can sort of look at them at your leisure, uh, that certain re regions of the brain are involved in um, spatial thinking, in moving different parts of the body, in sensing, in seeing, in hearing, tactile senses, pain. And we've known that, frankly, through pretty horrible experiments with animals where we sort of, yeah, I know, where we stick electrodes in their heads and we do things to them and we see what parts of the brain are active and inactive. We don't have to do that anymore. Uh, we also know that there's a left and a right side, that your left side of the brain controls the right side of the body and the right side of the brain controls the left side of the body. But there, there's a coding for academic thinking on the left and creative thinking on the right. Uh, academic being management, reasoning, linguistics, people who have a stroke on the left side or an injury to the left side of the brain. Um, will lose their speech, their ability to speak, whereas on the right side, that's more involved with um, sound, recognizing pictures, things like that. Again, how do we know that? We did nasty things to animals. Um, but the brain, because it's a, a neural system, and here's an example of a neuron, you have a hundred billion nerve cells in your head and each of these has connections to all these neurons beside it with a hundred trillion connections and every time you learn something you basically are creating new connections um, and that's how you like store it into firmware <laughs> when the brain operates it needs oxygen just like any other cell these cells need oxygen and the way the new imaging systems work is you're looking at two different imaging systems here. The gray is an MRI, magnetic resonance image. The red is an fMRI, a functional magnetic uh, resonant image. Let me tell you the difference. With fMRI, they stick your head in a big giant magnet and they pulse the magnet. They pulse on, off, on, off. That's that bang, 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 bang you hear if you've ever been in an fMRI. The magnet as it pulses is affecting the tiny little magnetic moments, the little magnetic spins of the, um, of the water molecules in the brain and particularly the hydrogen, oh, is it the hydrogen or the oxygen spins? I think it's the hydrogen spins, I think. I think, I gotta think about that. Yeah, I think it is. And that's what generates the picture, just of the soft tissue, just the fact that you can see the brain here. Yeah, you can see the bone, but you can really see the soft, cushy stuff here. You can see the, the gray matter, you can see the cerebellum, you can see lots of stuff. What's the red? The red comes from functional MRI. When the brain, when a part of the brain becomes active, it calls for more oxygenated blood. It calls for more hemoglobin. An oxygenated hemoglobin has a different magnetic spin properly than deoxygenated hemoglobin. So what you're actually looking at is, in a sense, blood flow to the brain. So that's what the red is. So this is an example if I'm, I don't remember the task. Well, let's see, what is this task? Ah, yes. It's um, your, your little, the pictures of all your little faces are covering up my, my slide. So this, <laughs> this is an fMRI when um, a subject is asked to perform a memory task. Like, can you remember back to, now what I don't know is whether this is a visual memory an auditory memory, um, a smell memory, um, but that's what that looks like. Let's see. Here's an, here's, um, an MR, FM, fMRI for three totally different um, activities. One is talking, one is tapping your finger, 
a particular finger and can you guess from the picture what finger not what finger but is it the left or the right yes it's the right side of the brain so it's a left finger of some sort and i bet we could even identify which finger if we knew enough about this uh, image here and then listening which remember from a previous slide is also the right side of the brain. So now we don't have to cut up rats and stick electrodes in them anymore. We can just do fMRI and get the same exact information. Okay, back to kinesthetic learning. What does this all have to do with kinesthetic learning? This is kind of a complicated slide. Do you see my cursor? Excellent, okay. I love this slide because it shows um, the power of kinesthetic learning in a fascinating way. You're looking at the fMRIs of two different types of people. Uh, these are sort of uh, MRIs collected from many, many, many people doing the same thing and then superimposed. That's what this is. They're sighted subjects, people who can see, and people who've been blind from birth. And so what the first slide was, was to identify faces. And in one group, in the sighted group, they could identify faces by looking at the faces and by touching the faces. And the tactile uh, the people who were blind from birth were just asked, well, since they can't see the faces, to identify them through touch only. So the top that I'm circling is uh, just visual for the sighted subjects, tactile for the uh, sighted subjects, and both. So take a look at both. So this tells you the parts of the brain that worked for people who can see and people who can feel. Compare that to the blind subjects who cannot see. And you might notice something really interesting, which is parts of the brain are illuminated for them. It, it doesn't look that different. There's visual that the way they look is not terribly different, except that they're not quite as bright. I don't know if you can see that. So the visual... Yeah, it's still pretty holistic. You would, you would expect to see, um, if you look up in the visual, in this visual area for the sighted subjects, uh, you can see some of that even lighting up. What, it, what this is trying to um, point out is that tactile learning is powerful. It, it, it codes into memory pretty strongly. It's not just your visual system. Okay, and then they had other things like uh, uh, actually playing around with a mechanical device and trying to fix it. Visually, tactily combined, and then for the sighted subjects. And here's something interesting. There's um, the same overlaps. But it, anyway, if you stare at these long enough, you, you sort of see that tactile alone is pretty powerful. It, it isn't that you absolutely have to have your visual system engaged. And of course, these people have had a lot of practice, right? They've been blind from birth. So the argument is, well, if we engage sighted people in more tactile learning, then it should be just as powerful in some ways. Okay, last example, and then I'm gonna show you some grown-ups learning um, astronomy. This is sort of a summary of what we're talking about. When you hear a, a word like cat, it brings up every memory you've ever had of cat. <laughs> you know, what? maybe you've seen them, maybe you've touched them, maybe you've smelled them, good Lord, maybe you've tasted them, uh, you've heard them. All the different ways you associate cat are brought to the surface. If you had no experience in some of these modalities, you wouldn't have as rich an understanding of the word cat. So here's pie, pie, like apple pie. You've pr you probably, I'm, you know, if you've e ever eaten pie, smelled pie, this is a very, very rich word for you. Dog, same thing, similar to cat. You may not have tasted your kitty or your dog. <laughs> Maybe you have. But now let's look at an astronomy word, sun. What modalities have been, ex have been activated? Visual. Visual, Eva says. Tactile. 
For sun, tactile, you know it's warm, okay. Odor? Not really. But imagine if you give learners as many of these experiences as they can that are meaningful, like, you know, just because, you know, you maybe spread peanut butter on a picture of the sun doesn't, maybe they'll associate it with peanut butter, but what the heck does that mean? They, they ha it has to be associated in some way with the properties of the sun, but, if you, if you yeah. Ah, yep, sunscreen and smell. Yep, great, great. Or if you've sunburned, then you have. <laughs> exactly. So as m as many of these modalities as you can use to code the idea of sun or whatever idea, um, the f more tightly in memory it, it'll stay. Okay. Now let's look at some examples of kinesthetic learning to teach adults. The next two videos come from a NASA project. Uh, it, uh, it's called uh, Universe After School or something. Anyway, it'll be in the title when you see it. And this also is about teaching adults about stars. So you can now compare. <laughs> Here we go. This kinesthetic activity models the life of a small to medium-sized star, such as our sun. Each person involved in this activity represents a bit of the material that goes into making such a star. As the activity begins, everyone is dancing or moving around freely, just bits of matter that are hanging out in some particular spot in space. As these bits of matter come close to one another, they start clumping together more and more due to gravity. After a while, this matter is clumped tightly enough to form a star. In our activity, the participants at the edges form a ring facing inward, as the outer shell of the star, with their hands raised to represent the inwardly directed force of gravity. The participants in the center face the star, representing the core of the star, with their hands also raised to represent the energy generated by the fusion of hydrogen at the center of the star. These two forces remain in balance for most of the star's life. We call this a main sequence star. Eventually, the star runs out of hydrogen to fuse in the core, and the balance of gravity and energy from fusion is broken. When this happens, gravity wins, and the participants in the core of the star drop their hands and move slightly closer together. The participants in the shell never lower their hands, as gravity is always in effect. The slight decrease in the size of the core makes it hot and dense enough to start fusing helium. The participants in the core raise their hands once more, as energy is again being generated at the center of the star. Participants in the shell take a step outward to represent the surge in energy, making the star larger than it was during the main sequence phase. The star has become a red giant. Finally, the core of the star runs out of helium to fuse. When this happens, the participants in the core once again drop their hands and move slightly closer together. This time, the decrease in core size only raises the temperature enough to allow one last burst of energy and push from the core. This causes the shell to drift away into space while the participants in the core move even closer together. At this stage, the participants in the center represent a white dwarf, while the shell has drifted off to become a planetary nebula. Eventually, the material that once formed the shell of this star will be available to be used in the formation of another star. All right, and now we're going to move to another complicated subject normally, which is a black hole. All right, kinesthetics and learning about black holes. And if you're trouble hearing, um, you can go turn up the volume. I, I'm, my volume's turned up all the way, but I'll see what I can do. <laughs> This is a kinesthetic model to help participants understand the effect a black hole has on objects in its neighborhood of space. All participants should be assigned one of four roles, black hole, orbiting star, nearby star, or distant star. You should scale the number of people in each role appropriately to the size of your group. A four or five foot diameter circle should be marked out on the floor. Using your rope or cord is a temporary way to do this. 
participants assigned to the role of black hole should stand in the center of the circle. The circle represents the black hole's event horizon, the point of no return. Anything that comes within the circle cannot escape the black hole. Participants assigned the role of orbiting star should start orbiting just outside of the rope circle. These objects are fully under the influence of the black hole's gravity, but still remain separate objects. Those assigned the role of nearby star will be orbiting a bit farther away from the circle. They are still influenced by the gravity of the black hole, but may also have other influences on their motion. They may at times come closer to the black hole, while at other times moving much farther away. The last of the participants are assigned the role of distant stars. They are even farther from the black hole and are too far away to be affected by its presence. For the most part, these objects continue in their roles with little deviation. A nearby star might very occasionally come close enough to bump an orbiting star into the black hole, but it's a rare occurrence. Contrary to popular mythology, the black hole does not immediately suck up everything in its neighborhood. So in our activity, we don't want everyone to end up in the black hole. Just as it plays out in the universe, not much changes even if you've got a black hole in your distant neighborhood. All righty, let me stop share a moment. Okay, so can you see me? Okay, excellent. All right. Um, so let's talk about this a little bit. This was a much um, higher level con content. Uh, this was also about stars, but I was joking before. Well, sure, we, can teach, we can't teach these kids nuclear synthesis, but we can teach it to grown-ups, and we teach it kinesthetically this time. Um, my question for you all is, what was the power of you using motion in this case for grown-ups? If you were imagining having a group of um, adults and you're trying to teach them nuclear synthesis, would this work? Why would it work? What are some of your reactions? And you can type them to Eva and Eva will talk them out loud to me. That way we won't get a lot of feedback. Oh, repeat the question. Yeah, just give some thought to, um, if you were to use this activity with a group of grown-ups, what do you think they would, do you think they'd learn? What's your reaction to it? Is this? Um... I was wondering if the adults can see the overall picture like we can see. Oh, great question. Um, we had an, a, an overhead view, right? Looking down at these grown-ups, these grown-ups, these people. <laughs> Um, would and it helps us kind of, of see the big picture of things would they have the same experience in their frame of reference that's a great question um, their experience would certainly be different uh, they're seeing it from uh, the orbiting star perspective or the black hole perspective and that is an interesting perspective to see things from you could always I guess video and show it but that's a great question Right, so grown-ups sometimes have an aversion to even standing up and moving, <laughs> and touching sometimes is difficult for them, which is odd, or just being seen touching other people. <laughs> um, that, and so do kids, actually. I mean, kids are a little bit better at that than grown-ups are. Uh, that is a challenge, and um, I think part of the reason certainly is that we're not used to having grown-ups learn kinesthetically, they're not used to doing it that way. Um, just giving people encouragement, saying it's gonna be worth your while to be just a little uncomfortable, encouraging people who are sitting off in the corner who would just like to look at things and don't wanna get involved, to tell them, I always say, we don't have any tourists in this workshop, you have to participate. Um, I promise it'll be worth your while. Just keep promising that, sometimes that helps. What else, what other reactions do you have to using this kind of activity in your outreach? Anything else? I think it's a good, um, as they say, icebreaker activity because once you're comfortable doing yeah. that, then you've kind of got it. 
I don't know if you can hear that, but Eva said, um, I think it's a good icebreaker activity. Certainly would be a good way to get have people in your workshop get to know each other. If you're doing a multiple day workshop or a week long workshop, as often as you can get them up face to face, introducing one another. There's a kinesthetic activity, somewhat kinesthetic, that I used to do in geology, which is um, everybody had a had a rock in their hand and they had to write out a description of that rock with as much detail as possible and then place that on their backs and then put the rock back and people had to try to match the rock with the description on their backs and so you know they would look at the backs and hold the rock and everybody's getting up and looking at each other and introducing each other uh, so there's kind of get to know you activities that are pretty good that way I think another thing too is that a lot of times people have different ways that they like to learn or they learn more readily some people are visually driven some right. people are audio, audio people so I think that this adds another component right to ensure that everyone there is getting the experience. Great point. So Eva just said, you know, there, there are a lot of different ways that we learn. They're visual learners, people who are better at listening, people who are better at doing things using their hands. There are people that are just naturally um, kinesthetic who tend to learn. They, these are the folks who dance well, who do sports well. Um, they're learn, they tend to learn through modalities that the rest of us don't. Um, there's also learning theory that says we have the abilities to do all of these things, to be better at kinesthetics, at um, auditory learning, at visual learning, at all these different modalities, but school tends to focus on just two of them, it tends to focus on visual and auditory. You listen to lectures, you read books, right? Um, and we're now moving toward more and more hands-on kinesthetic activities, but the more holistic you can be, and not just do one at a time, but blend them together, um, they say the better learning is for kids. All right, let's go back to the, uh, I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit. I had an activity, but I'm gonna spare you and do it another time. Um, this is something I showed last, last meeting we were talking about um, how to do activities with really 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 big groups hundreds and thousands of people how do you do hands-on activities with that big of a group and I showed this which inspired this this month's um, this month's topic of kinesthetic learning so I'll show you this and sort of end with it um, one of the projects I'm involved with and the ASP is now involved with is uh, working with Tibetan monks in exile in India and the Dalai Lama wants, um, wants monastics to understand Western science so that Tibetan Buddhism doesn't become stale and remains relevant in the world. And, and the nice fellow in the Hawaiian shirt is Dr. Chris Impey, who is going to actually be receiving um, the ASP's award for outstanding public educator. And he is leading an activity with the monks on um, on gravitational attraction of masses. Basically, what we saw in the other video um, on. Someone wanted that picture of him already, but you haven't turned it on yet. Oh, I, yeah. Oh, can you see? Can people see the. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I haven't shared my screen. I'm terrible. Let me try that again. I've just been yammering and not sharing screen. Hold on, little technical challenge here. Thank you for telling me. Uh, okay, how's about now? Yeah, that's the way to do it. Okay. There's the fellow in the Hawaiian shirt, Dr. Chris Impey. <laughs> and they're the monks. And this is in, uh, I think this is in, in Dharamsala, India. So I'm going to play this. Um, next video for you and what you're going to see is an activity that Chris does and he's doing it here with the monks where he has um, discs on the floor and there's a heads and a tails and he has the monks turn them all heads up um, and monks being who they are they're they have infinite patience uh, they have no problem turning all these little things heads up and then he has the monks move each disc 
to its neighbor, to its nearest neighbor by a certain number of steps. And when they move, they get flipped back to tails. And when all the little disks have been moved and their tails, then they go through the whole process again and flip it back to heads to see what happens over time as gravity affects these random, randomly dispersed disks. And so this is a high speed video. So you don't have to watch this in real time. It would take a long time. Oops, 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 back, back, back. And so there they go. So they're clumping them together based on their nearest neighbors and then flipping them over as they do it. And you can see the clumping. And now they're gonna do the same thing again, clumping to nearest neighbors and stacking. There they go. And now it's even more clumped and you can start to see galaxies or star formation. And one more time, clumping, clumping, clumping. And what was random, you just ram, randomly distributed is now definitely clumped. And now they smash them all together. I have five more minutes. What excellent timing because I'm done. So here is um, some places where you can go for more information. So the kinesthetic astronomy activity um, that we saw. Uh, oh, no, I'm sorry. There's a kinesthetic astronomy activity that's um, written up at the Space Science Institute that you can take a look at. After School Universe, where we got the two films um, of the black hole and of nucleosynthesis. There is a manual that goes along with it, a written manual. You can find it right here. My Sky Tonight sample activities are available on our website, so you can take a look at those. We don't have the ones I showed you written up yet because they're brand spanking new. We we're just, but they will be, they will be there. But there's other wonderful activities. If you want to read more about fMRI, um, I recommend this particular article, which is a very good, simple, but very scientifically accurate um, discussion. Then I got a couple more for you, two more activities you may want to consider. One of them is called Mars Opposition Dance. So you can um, use your bodies to model the orbits of the Earth and Mars and see what it means to be in opposition and conjunction and so forth and so on. Oh, and our partners at the Bryce Canyon also does a similar uh, kinesthetic gravity activity with the same name but with people with Kundalini rings. So. Right, so the uh, monks activity you saw with the uh, coins can be done with people. You don't need coins, you can do people. Um, and Mercury, it's time has come, um, another Kinesthetic activity, uh, I think, and Susie Girton, who I believe is online, can chime in or somebody. I think that's the, tr it's either the transit or orbits of Mercury or both. Mars opposition dance is also on UAUIM. Okay. Mars opposition dance can also be found at Universe at your fingertips. In case you haven't heard, the ASP is is your go-to place for hands-on astronomy activities. So if you go to our website, www dot astrosociety.org and look up activities you'll be able to find lots and lots there and that brings an end to another episode that's a wrap as they say so i want to thank you all for coming i hope you had a good time tell your friends uh we do this once a month it's called wednesdays with linda we're going to change the name because that's just way too something something for me I know. <laughs> so if you have another name for it, you can pass it along. But uh, from Galactic Headquarters here in San Francisco of the Astronomical Society of the Pacific, we bid you adieu. Keep looking up. And please tell your friends. And tell your friends. If you want to share, it will be available tomorrow. The recording will be up. Yes. Okay. Safe travels. <laughs>